Good morning, church. I have some important things to tell you about, some things that are coming up. Uh, But before I get to those things, let me me tell you that at the end of the service, if you're a first-time guest, I don't know if there are any first-time guests here today, but if there are, uh, at the end of the service, my wife and I uh, would love to meet you back here at the welcome table and just get to know you. And so fill out your connection card and hold on to it. Don't put it in the offering basket. For everyone else... You take that, that connection card that you received, and uh, you fill it out, and uh, let me know through that communication card, let Pastor Billy know through that connection card what's going on in your life, how we can pray for you. You may or may not be surprised uh, by this, but that is the one most effective way that Pastor Billy and I find out about stuff in your life. Now, a number of you, we, we, we maybe talk on the phone or we see you during the week, but some of you, that's like the only connection we have. So use that. It's a tool to be used effectively in that way. Okay, so here's what's coming up. Uh, first of all, uh, I did a video on this. Congratulations, you are really getting connected as a church. In fact, this week we had more people in our gospel communities than we have in this room right now. So uh, we, we, we've got really good connection points, really good opportunities for you to get to know people and you are doing that. You are, uh, you are attending your small groups, what we call, that's what we call them gospel communities. Uh, and, and so I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you that you've been really connecting that way. It's been a good semester. And, and under, under Pastor Billy's leadership, gospel communities are going well. Here's what's coming up. Here's what I want to tell you about. Uh, this Wednesday begins a really important season for the church, and I mean the church universal, and I mean the church historical, and that is the season of Lent. You may not uh, have any idea what Lent is other than that stuff that you take off your shirt with the the roller. Uh, You know what I'm talking about? Uh, But that's not the Lent we're talking about. We're talking about Lent as a season in the church. Lent, historically in the church, has has been a time, it's actually 40 days uh, not including the six Sundays that, are, that, are, that, that fall during that period. Lent is, 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 is a period of 40 days before Easter during which we get ready for Easter. Um, I don't mean we like hang up signs or we get the house ready, although maybe you do things to, to, get, to, to get your house ready for Easter. But, but spiritually, uh, internally, we prepare for Easter. If Easter is the most high, holy day of the year, if Easter is, is that one Sunday in which, like, like no other Sunday, we remember and celebrate the gospel story of Jesus, then it's good and right for us to prepare for that. So historically, um, in the early church days, people would, would say, I want to follow Jesus. I, want, I, I was a pagan. Maybe I followed the God of Molech, although probably during that time it wouldn't have been Molech, but some, some weird, uh, some eclectic Roman uh, god uh, or many gods, but I don't want to follow them anymore. I want to follow Jesus. Then the church would say, okay, well, we're going to spend the next 40 days, the season of Lent, teaching you and preparing you and making sure that you understand the cost of following Jesus. And then, and then um, Good Friday, uh, the Saturday, the day before Easter, uh, and then Easter Sunday, during that weekend, we will baptize you, and then you will be a Christian. So 40 days of, of preparing your heart to ultimately make that faith commitment. Now, it's a little bit different uh, in our tradition, but we're going to take the next 40 days plus Sunday, plus the Sundays during this season of Lent to just prepare our hearts for Easter. Anyway, all that to say, we are beginning with an Ash Wednesday service. This, it's not really a service. This Wednesday at noon, if you would like to come and pray or be prayed for, uh, Pastor Billy and I are opening up this space at noon this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, uh, for prayer. I'm also going to have ashes that will be made from a palm, from one of our Palm Sundays in years past. That's historically how the church has made the, if you ever wonder where those ashes come from, in the Ash Wednesday service, they come from the palms from a Palm Sunday service from the prior year. In this case, the palm that I have is from like three years ago. We're going to use that. I'm going to make some ashes. Uh, and if you want to impose ashes on your, your forehead as a rem- reminder that, that I am now coming before the Lord, um, repenting, uh, looking for a change of heart. This is a season of, 
of, of, of repentance and of heart preparation. If you want, no, nobody's going to impose ashes on you, but if you want to do that, they'll be here. Uh, mo- we're just going to really pray Ash Wednesday, this Wednesday at noon. And then beginning on Friday, every Friday, this space is going to be open. What time is, what, what's the time on the prayer? Friday. What? Six to seven every Friday here from now until Easter. We'll pray for one another. We'll pray for our Easter service. We'll pray that the Lord would move among us and move in our community during this season of Lent. So anyway, that's what's going on. Wednesday at noon, a simple prayer gathering. Fridays at six, simple prayer gatherings. Hope you will enjoy, uh, hope you'll enjoy join us uh, for that time. Okay. I think, that's, I think that's everything. Let me pray for us. God, we come before you this morning thankful for your grace in our lives, the gift that you have given us. We come before you this morning um, remembering once again that except by your grace, we wouldn't breathe and we wouldn't be alive and we wouldn't be saved from the sin of our past, and we wouldn't have an eternity and a future and a hope. That's all by your grace, O Lord. And so we celebrate your grace this morning. We believe that you have something for us today in the way of of, of your word, um, the scriptures, and we believe that you have something for us today in the way of the table of communion as you will impart something to us in a supernatural and a mystical way. We look forward to that. We celebrate all that you're going to do in our lives today, Lord. Come and move among us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, week two in Colossians. Last week was a lot of information. Last week was really a, an intro to the book. So if you, didn't, if you weren't here last week, you might jump online sometime this week and listen to it just because it's informative. It introduces the book of Colossians. We're not going to cover that information or recover that information today. Um, I do have one slide that will give you a summary of what the church is um, or what the what, the summary of the church in Colossae? Did we just lose it? Okay, so I'm going to just read it to you, and if it pops back up, then it pops back up. It was a young church, Colossae, the church that Paul wrote to in Colossae. It was a young church. It was a church that was discovering what it meant to believe in Jesus. There, there. Many of them had been pagans prior to following Jesus. Uh, it was a church that, uh, Paul, that Paul was in awe of um, because they were a, a church of, that they were people of, of prayer, or faith and hope and love. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Now, where we're at as a, as, as a, as a, as a church God's people, that's you, that's me, God's people sometimes become God's people like you're converted to Christianity before we have clarity as to all that means. Let me say that again. God's people sometimes become God's people before they have real clarity as to what that even means to be a Christ follower. Should we just turn that off? Because it's, there we go. All right, let's go back to that slide, and then I won't have to think about it. Nobody have to think about it anymore. Just go to the, go to wherever the, all right, I'm going to say this a third time. And now you just listen real closely, because this is kind of the, the, the hinge point on, 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 that's determining where we're going today. God's people, that's you and me, God's people sometimes become God's people, like you're converted to Christianity, before you have real clarity as to what that even means. And for some of us, God's people, maybe you have been a child of God, a follower of Jesus for a long time, but maybe you don't have absolute clarity as to what that even means. What exactly happened when you were converted to Christianity, when you became a Christ follower? And number two, why was it necessary for you to become a Christ follower? 
That's what I want us to talk about today, and that's what Paul gets into in the book of Colossians today. What does it even mean to be a Christ follower, and why is it necessary? Okay, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, old school. I've asked, you, I've asked you several times in the last six weeks to really get into the habit of bringing your Bible on your phone or bringing your Bible in print or whatever, and so now, now you see why that's a good idea. So turn there to Colossians chapter 1, and let's, I'll read out loud, and you can follow along. Yeah, uh, maybe we are going to have it after all. Let's get to that slide, Colossians 1 verse 9. Okay. I'm going to read verse 9, the the beginning of it, and I'm going to explain it, and then I'm going to read the rest of it. It says, Paul says to the, the church in Colossae, he says, for this reason... Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. Okay, stop. I just want to define for this reason. Last week, what Paul said was, I'm in awe of you, Colossae, because you are a people of faith and a people of hope and a people of love. And we're not going to develop that. We talked about that last week. But, but t- today, Paul says, for that reason, the fact that you are a people of faith and you are a people of hope and a people of love, For that reason, since the day I heard about that, I have not stopped praying for you. I've been praying for you constantly, probably like a good Jewish man would have done, a good Jewish woman would have done, probably prayed for them in the morning when he got up. He probably prayed for them at the noon hour, and he probably prayed for them at dusk in the evening. He prayed for Colossae among the other churches that he was praying for all the time. Okay, let's let's go on. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His, of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing, uh, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, so there's like so much here that you may have a hard time following along, and and that's okay. We're going to unpack it. But there's so much here that we can't unpack. We can't unpack everything, or else we would spend the entire year in the book of Colossians, and that would be okay, but that's that's not our plan. So I'm going to leave some of this out of the sermon, just because we don't have time, and and just focus today on what I believe the Lord has told me that we ought to really drill down deep on today. But first, a little preliminary. So Paul is writing to these young believers. I keep stressing that because it's important. They're young in their faith. I don't mean they're young in their age, but they're young in their faith. They haven't been, they haven't been following Christ that long. These young believers who are in Christ and who are in Colossae, so they're very real people with all the problems of living in a town that's seen its better days, uh, and the, the main trade route no longer goes through Colossae, it goes around Colossae. And, and he only has one goal for them in this book. There are many things he could talk to them uh, about, but there's really only one goal that he has in this book, and that is that the young Christians in the church of Colossae would grow in Christian maturity. And so the two big questions, when I start talking about Christian maturity, you growing up and being mature As a Christ follower, the two big questions would be, number one, what does that look like? How does a Christian know whether or not he or she is growing in maturity? Those are the two questions. What does it look like, and how can I personally know? Like, if I asked you, like, are you spiritually mature? Have you you grown up? Are you in the process of growing up? as a Christ follower, or are you just like you were the day you started following Jesus? 
Paul's intention in the book of Colossians is to see these young people grow up in their faith. And so that's going to be our goal over the next six weeks as we study this book, that we would, we would grow some. We would, we would grow up some in the next six, as much as we can in six weeks. And the nature of Paul's prayer in this passage we just read today is this, that God would fill you with the knowledge of his will through wisdom and understanding that only comes from the Holy Spirit. So if Paul was praying this over you, us today, he would be praying that, 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 that God would fill us with the knowledge of his, the Lord's will in our lives. So for you, for us to, to perpetually live life as an immature Christian, which I'm not saying that you are, I'm not saying that you aren't, I don't completely know. I, I kind of know in some of your lives whether or not you are, but, but to live a life as an immature Christian, unaware of what God has done in your life, unaware of what God is doing in your life, is to live a life of defeat. If, if you feel like defeat maybe would be a word that would define your relationship with the Lord right now, th then I would ask perhaps, perhaps there is Christian maturity that needs to happen in your life. But what does that really mean, Christian maturity? Well, according to Paul's writing today, it means that we, have, we, have, we are given by God an understanding of, of, of what he's really doing in our lives, his will in our life. Like we would pray, God, give me a clear understanding. Who are you? What are you doing? I want to know you more. I want to understand what you're doing in my life. I want to have a, a clarity of thought regarding who you are, what you were doing in my life. Because sadly, as a pastor, sadly, I know this too well. I know people that, that, have, have, been, that, that have attended multiple churches that I've, that I've preached in and led. So like people that I've known that have followed, followed uh, at, at some level or some distance, followed Jesus for decades, and have heard dozens or hundreds of sermons, and yet they still have no real clarity of thought as to what God has done in their lives, God, God's will for their lives. And so if we're going to grow up, if we're going to mature, according to what Paul is saying here, we're going to grow in our understanding of God's will, and how is that going to happen? It's going to happen through the life and the breath of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit moving among us. So what we're talking about today is what He has done, that's God's grace in our lives, and what He's, what he's continuing and will do in the future, and that's the future grace. What God's doing in our lives right now, what He has done on the cross, what He is doing, and what He will do. His grace and his future grace in our lives. Notice that Paul says in this passage that the Christian life can be lived in a way such that we please God in every way. Did you catch that? That's in verse 10. His prayer is that the Colossians would, would grow up, would be mature, would understand what God has done, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. I don't know if that is astounding to you or if that's confusing to you, if that even, if that even uh, is of interest to you, but I'm fascinated by the idea that, that, that the, the, the God of the universe, the God who is distant, far off, and the God who is near and close at the same time, that somehow... I could do something, I could live a life that would be pleasing to the Lord. Think on that for a moment. Have you ever thought that maybe you could live a life, that you could do something, that you could, you could live your life out in such a way that the Lord would say, that brings me pleasure. That, that the Lord would actually smile down upon you. That is not beyond the reach of the believer. In fact, that is, that is God's will for your life, that you would live a life in such a way that it would be pleasing to him, in such a way that he would, he would approve and he would, he would look down with, with pleasure and he would, he would smile. There's a story, sadly, 
in the Old Testament, there's a story of, of a time when, when God stopped listening to his people. He stopped, he stopped listening because of, of just the, 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 the immense amount of displeasure that they brought to him. I just want to read it to you. It's a passage that you may have heard before. If Amos, Amos chapter 5. The, the people of God, although their hearts were far from him, they continued to get together and sing songs. They continued to get together and, and follow the rituals and, and do, the, do, the, just do the stuff uh, that, that they'd always done in the way of, of giving lip service to the Lord. But they, they left their hearts at home and they would come to worship, basically. And, Jesus, and God says this to them. He says, Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. It's, it's, in that Old Testament passage, it's as, as God, like, as he covers his ears and he's like, oh, the noise that you make is, is, is displeasing to me. You, your songs, they're so fake. I don't want to... I just stop with all the noise. It's, it's probably not surprising to us that we can actually bring displeasure to the Lord. And much of the story of the Old Testament goes like that, doesn't it? But what you may have never thought about is the fact that you can actually bring pleasure to the Lord with your life. First Thessalonians 4 says it this way. As for the matters, as for, um, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this, to do it more, and to do it more. This is Paul, same writer, Paul, he's telling the church in Thessalonica, you, you can live a life that, that is pleasing to the Lord, and in fact, it says you are living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. So this isn't, a message, this isn't just a message that, that Paul had for the church in Colossae. It's a message that, cha- that, that he had for the church in Thessalonica. It's a message that he has for us today, that, that we can actually live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. God looks on you as his new creation, his, his children, and he declares, he cl- declares his new creation good. Now, some of you, not very many people in your life have called you good or said that, that you're, you're pleasing, that, 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 that you're all cleaned up, that you're good, that you're a child of God. But, but that's what the Lord says, that you're pleasing to him. Christian maturity springs out of a, a personal relationship with a loving heavenly Father who finds pleasure in who you are. Okay, so here's where we're going to spend the rest of the time today. <clears throat> the, if you go to the next slide, uh, there are four things that God has done in your life, and that's where Paul kind of lands the plane in this passage today. There are four things that Paul says God has done in your life. This is just the first one of them. We're going to look at all four of them. So today, we're, again, we're talking about well, what does it mean to be a Christ follower? Like, I, I'm, I'm a child of God, but, but I don't exactly know what that means. Why was conversion really necessary? What really happened in that process? So today what we're talking about, for the rest of the time, four things God has done for you. Number one, this passage says that He has qualified you. He has qualified you. What does that even mean? I want to read that, read the verse again. Verse 12 says, In giving thanks, joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of God. He has qualified you to receive a kingdom inheritance. Now, with each of these four things that God has done, I want to give you a hang up. Like something that, like, man, Randy, Pastor Randy, I just, I don't quite, I can't, I'm not quite feeling that. 
I'm not quite feeling it. The hang up on this one, that God has qualified you to receive a kingdom inheritance, inheritance is you would say this maybe. You'd say, today, um, late February of 2022, I don't feel very worthy. I don't feel like a person of worth. I don't feel very qualified to call myself a Christ follower, to inherit the kingdom of God, to call myself a child of God, a son of the living God, a, a daughter of the living God. You might say today, I, don't, I, I just kind of feel worthless. So, so God would say to you that he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his people. What does that mean? It means this. It means that there are no longer any barriers separating you from all that God has for you in Jesus Christ. He has qualified you. You can, you can step into the game of life. You can, you can walk into the church knowing that you're, he has qualified you. He is, he, you belong here. You belong among the children of God. The things that used to separate you, your pride, your own sin, those things have been left behind. We're going to talk about that when we talk about the other things that God has done in your life. Those things have been left behind. First Peter chapter 2 says this, but you are a chosen people. God, God chose you to be his child. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What this passage is saying is that you haven't always been a child of God. That's, that hasn't always been true. According to the story of the Bible, we're not all just immediately born and we're automatically Christ followers and we're automatically forgiven of our sins and we're automatically all part of the, the family, the, the, the people of faith. You know that. that. That's a process that has happened in your life. Maybe in the last few years, maybe early in your life when you were a child, you haven't always been qualified to, to receive the inheritance that comes through Jesus for eternity, but you now are. In fact, Romans chapter 9, I'm just going to tell you about it. Romans chapter 9 talks about how even in the nation of Israel, not every man, woman, not every child that was born into the nation of Israel was actually spiritually an Israelite. It's kind of a little play on words there, but, but, but not every who, everyone who was physically born into the nation of Israel was spiritually born into the nation of Israel. And the same is true of the church in Colossae. The, the Colossians had not come into this inheritance automatically, but God made them into the family of God. God has, has qualified you to receive the inheritance that he has for you for eternity. Number two, this passage today says that God has rescued you from the domain of darkness. By the way, all of these, we're talking about being qualified, talking about being rescued, and then we're going to talk about being redeemed. We're going to talk about being forgiven. All of these, there's, there's like this a metaphorical nature to them. All these, Paul wants you to understand the depth and the breadth of, of what it means to be a Christ follower. So these are all words that, that by themselves don't completely tell the story. So he throws out another metaphor. And he throws out another metaphor. And then he throw, so he says, you're qualified. And then he says, okay, let me say it a different way. Let me say, let me say you're you're redeemed, I'm sorry, you're rescued from the domain of darkness. Now, we live in an era where within the church, we probably don't talk enough about the domain of darkness. The fact that there is this very real spiritual battle 
going on. And there are very dark forces in our existence that, that want to, to take your life, uh, want to pull you away from the Father, uh, want to, to, to damn you, uh, want, to, want, to, want to kill you. Uh, and, and maybe you'd say, like, I don't really like talking about that. It kind of weirds me out. But which, what I want to remind you is that, that the Apostle Paul, he believed in the existence of very dark powers. That Jesus spoke numerous times about the very real existence of, of, of dark powers, evil forces. Other New Testament writers, Paul, New Testament writers, Jesus, they all believed in the existence of a, a dark power to whom the human race is subject because of our sin. And then they also talk, Paul, the New, other New Testament writers, Jesus, they talk about the beautiful reality that God, He determined that in Jesus Christ, you would be rescued out of this realm of darkness, and that sin at that point would no longer have power over you. And so that's what it means to be rescued, that you have been rescued out of the domain of darkness, and you have been delivered up to the kingdom of God. Now, the hang-up that we, because I said every one, of, every one of these has a hang-up, the hang-up in this one is many of us still feel very vulnerable and emotionally unsafe. You might feel like at any point Satan's going to take me out. At, at any point I feel like I'm... I'm I'm losing my mind. At, at any point, I just feel vulnerable. I've been taken advantage of in the past, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm primed and ready to be taken advantage of again in the future by Satan himself, by, by some other dark force. I want to, I want to point out that, that God has been on a rescue mission. He has been a rescuer throughout the history of the world. This isn't a new game for him that he is going to rescue out of the domain of darkness and, and, and deliver you into the kingdom of heaven for eternity. If you read the Old Testament, you see time and time again that God is a rescuer. All of these dramatic rescue operations that he goes on, perhaps, perhaps the most dramatic or the one that maybe comes to mind to you uh, first would be in the Old Testament when he rescued the, the nation of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, and he delivered them to the promised land. God rescues his children, not from a literal, although sometimes yes, but not from a literal oppressor all of the time, but he all of the time rescues us from the domain of darkness. The harsh reality of the, of the tyranny of, of harsh rule of darkness has been replaced. It's been replaced by the tender, sovereign lordship of Christ in your life, and you are safe. You can rest. You can find security in that. He is he has rescued you from the domain of darkness. He has delivered you into his kingdom of light. Romans 5 says this, As sin reigned in death, grace now reigns through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've been rescued out of the domain of darkness. Romans 6 says this, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. Through Christ's work on the cross, God has defeated this power of darkness over us. And now he is, He's building a new kingdom in its place. And that's where we, Christ's followers, reside for eternity. 
So God has qualified you, number one. He has qualified you. You belong here. You belong in the family of God. Regardless of whether or not you feel like it, he has qualified you and, and you belong. Number two, he has rescued you out of the domain of, of, of darkness, all the junk and yuckiness that you maybe have lived in in the past. He has, he has rescued out, you out of that and you now have been delivered into the kingdom of light. And the third metaphor, the third thing that he has done is he has redeemed you. He has redeemed you. Now, when I see that word, redeemed, the first thing that comes to my mind is when I was a kid and used to get little coupons. They still have coupons now, right? But uh, when I used to go to school, when I used to go to elementary school, if, um, if you got... If it, the, the, bar, the bar was pretty high back then. I think maybe you, you would get a coupon to go to Pizza Hut, I'll tell you what, if you like, were an, an, a straight-A honor student. Now I think maybe they give you a coupon if you just go to school. But back then you had to like get A's. And so they gave you this coupon, and then you would take it to Pizza Hut, and you would get a personal pan pizza. Do they, do they even make those anymore? Is that even the thing now? Uh, no, okay, I didn't think so. But back then, they had this thing called a personal pan pizza, and it was this greasy mess. It was about this big, and it was deep, and it was just your own personal pan pizza. That's the name. And you would take this coupon, and you would go, and that, that, that transaction was called a redemption. You would, you would turn in the coupon, and you would you would redeem it, or you would, you would get out of that coupon whatever you deserved as a, you know, as, by giving them that coupon. So Paul, in this passage today, he says that God is, he has qualified you, he has rescued you, and then he goes to this metaphor. He says he has redeemed you. Now, the, in the Roman world, in that day, uh, these, these pagans in the church that had just become Christians, because in the, in the church of Colossae, you had people that had never been, never been uh, Jews, they, were, they, they had been pagans, and now they're Christians. But we also had some Jews that had become Christians. But first of all, the pagans there, when, when they read that letter, and Paul says that, that God has redeemed you, what they probably heard was they probably thought about the, the, the system of slavery in the Roman world. And so this would have been an allusion to being purchased out of uh, the, the slave market. The idea for the, for the pagan who had become a Christian who read this uh, passage, when they hear Paul say, God has redeemed you, what they thought was like, I used to be a slave, like just on the market. I was a commodity. I was something to be, to be bought and sold, just kind of trash. Like I wasn't really fully, uh, people didn't see the dignity, value, and worth that, that I have. I was a slave on the market to be bought and sold. But, but God has, has, has purchased me, redeemed me, bought me out of the market. I'm no longer a commodity. He has taken me off the trading block and made me his child. He has redeemed me. People can no longer just treat me as though I'm a commodity because now I'm a child of God. He has redeemed me. We are no longer slaves to sin. And I think we need to hear that this morning, and I think we're going to, I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a bit. We're no longer slaves to sin. We have, we have been bought out of slavery. We have been redeemed. And, and God says, you used to be treated like trash, like a commodity. You used to be like a slave to whomever wanted to have their way with you. But now I have redeemed you. You're no longer, you're no longer on the market. You're, you're now a child of God. Now, the, the, the Jewish Christians in Colossae who read this letter, they would have heard something slightly different. They would have heard, when they, when they, heard, when they heard the word redemption, they would have thought this word, no doubt, alluded to their rich history of God redeeming them out of the slavery of of Egypt. So it's the same metaphor, but a slightly different context. 
For the pagan who had become a Christian, they're thinking about being bought off of the trading block in the slave market in this, this Roman slave system. The Jew would have read that, the Jewish Christian would have read that and thought back to their forefathers and mothers who had been, who had been redeemed out of slavery in Egypt and brought to the promised land. Now, there's a hang-up on this with this, with this uh, metaphor as well, that you've been redeemed. The hang-up here is, um, and this is maybe the most painful one, it goes something like this. Pastor Randy, I think I'm a Christian, but I'm still enslaved to habitual sins. I, in fact, enjoy them, and I hide them, so nobody knows about them, so that I don't have to give them up. And so in your case, you, you may feel as though you're still enslaved. And I would have to ask you, is that, is that by your own choice that you're still living as though you're a slave to sin? The fact of the gospel truth is that, that God has redeemed you. He has bought you off the market, out of that system. You are no longer, if you're a Christ follower, you're no longer a slave to sin. And then the last thing that Paul says in today's passage is that you've been forgiven. That he has, that he has forgiven you. Chief among the blessings that Christ has, has ushered in with his work on the cross is the fact that your sin has been dealt with. This separation between you and God, which is your sin, your pride, your rebellion, that has been dealt with on the cross. That, that Christ, who knew no sin, became for you sin so that you, that I, might therefore become the righteousness of Christ. So he takes our sin, we take his righteousness. His work on the cross means that you are forgiven. Now the hang up in this one is I still feel guilty like, it, not that you're still, if, if this is your hang-up, then it's not that you're still sinning. It's just that you feel like you're still sinning. Like, what do we call that? We call that guilt, right? Like, this happens in all sorts of ways in our lives where you might wake up one morning and you just feel really guilty about something. And then, have you ever happened this? And then you realize, Wow, I did that like decades ago, but I'm still carrying around like, like baggage, like a suitcase. I'm still carrying around this, this guilt. And what I, what I want to, to say, I believe it's Jesus speaking through me to you today, is you, you can let that go. You are no longer defined by the sin of your past. Christ dealt with that on the cross. No longer defines you. God in heaven doesn't see you that way anymore. I've noticed as a pastor over the years that, that there, for some people, and maybe this is you, you're harder on yourself than Jesus is. He's forgiven you. He has washed the slate clean. Again, chief among the blessings that Christ has ushered in with his work on the cross is the fact that your sin has been dealt with. You are forgiven. This hang-up, I still feel guilty. I, I, I can't let it go. I'll say it this way. I don't feel let off the hook. I want to say it that way because I want to tell you a little story. Um, I don't feel let off the hook. And that's, that's like if sin... Was a, 
It was a hook that was in your mouth. If you're a, if you're a fisherman, you know what I'm talking about. Like, like you just get dragged around. Then what, what God does in, in this, is, this is not complete. I mean, the, way more than just this, but he takes that hook out of your mouth so that you no longer have to be led around by the sin that used to drag you around. And just another, another metaphor, another way of looking at it. You're no longer a slave to sin. Another way of saying it would be you're no longer on the hook. But the truth is, some of us, we continue to live as though that hook is still in our, in our mouths and, and as though sin still has sway over us and we allow it to still be our master when in reality, the hook is out of your mouth. Here's the story I want to tell you about. Um, we, the Caulfields, when we can, we, we go fishing, although we don't have nearly enough time to do that because we're all busy people. But when we go fishing, I mean, we're, 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 it's, it kind of defines, uh, it, 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 it's a big part of who we are as a family. Um, and so sometimes when me or one of, my, one of my kids, when we hook a fish, um, and by the way, we typically, all, we typically release them. I know that like for, for, for people that don't necessarily fish, like why in the world would you catch fish and then throw it back in the water? It's crazy. But that's what we do. We, we often do that. We keep some. We, we release a lot of the fish. First, we take the hook out of their mouths. Now, what's, what's always intriguing to me is sometimes when we release a fish, it does not immediately swim away. There are several factors, one being fatigue. Uh, but, but I think another factor involved in that fish, you put it back in the water, and rather than just swimming off immediately, it'll just lay there. Fatigue is one reason, but another reason is there's this sense of once you have, have controlled them, and they feel as though you have won the battle, I think that there's a, I don't know if mental would be the right word, but there's this sense of being overtaken, overcome, such that the fish for a moment, even though you've taken the hook out of its mouth and you have taken your hands off the fish, it feels as though you are still its master. And then at some point, though, it begins to move and it begins to realize you are no longer master over me. The, the hook is no longer in my mouth. And it's as though we, the anglers, are saying to the fish, you're free to go now. You're free to go now. Now what I want you to understand, if you're just convinced that you're still a slave to sin, that you're still a captive, that you're still on the hook, What I want you to know is that Jesus, this morning, he says to you, I've, I've, I've paid the price. Uh, I have made you qualified to be a child of God. You, you belong here. Dignity, value, worth, you belong here. I have rescued you from the, the domain of darkness. I have, I have delivered you into the kingdom of light. He says, I have, I have redeemed you. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're, you're no longer a commodity to be used. You are now a child of the living God. And Jesus says, I have, I have forgiven you that hook that was in your mouth, the hook of guilt and sin and shame and slavery to sin, that hook has been removed. And just like that, that fish that, that needs a little bit of coaxing, I think what your sin and what Jesus most importantly would say is, you're free to go now. Like, sin is no longer the master over you. It no longer owns you. You are free to move on, to, to swim, and to live, as, to live as a child 
a son, a daughter of the living God. May that be for you. Amen. Let's pray. God, we, we often live in shame and we often live in pain and guilt and we want to be released from that. We celebrate your goodness today. We celebrate the fact that long ago you determined that, that in Jesus you would qualify us rescue us and redeem us forgive us and so we come to the table of communion this morning to celebrate that all that you have done for us in Christ Jesus we thank you God for determining that long ago that you would do that you would you would sacrifice your son in order to achieve for us all that we talked about today and Jesus we celebrate you today you were you voluntarily submitted yourself to the will of the Father. And you didn't consider heaven something to be grasped or held onto, but you came to earth. You humbled yourself. You went to the cross out of obedience to the Father that we might be saved, that we might be forgiven. And Holy Spirit, we celebrate you today. We invite you to move freely among us, move in our hearts, move in our lives. Holy Spirit, if we are going to have an understanding of God's will in our lives, as Paul talked about in this passage, it's going to be because you come, Holy Spirit, and you move in us and you move on, among us. So you're welcome here today, Holy Spirit. Would you, you, would you move in us? So, so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we, we lift up your name. May you... May you find pleasure in our lives, in the words on our mouths, and, and the thoughts that, that no one else sees but you, and, and in our actions. May you, may you look down and, and be pleased. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.